Harriet Tubman, Chapter 20, The Lecture Platform. Harriet spent most of the winter of 1858 and 1859 in Boston. She was badly in need of funds. There was the mortgage on the house in Auburn, which she never seemed to be able to pay off, no matter how hard she worked, and she wanted to make another trip to Maryland. By this time, she was known by reputation throughout the North. Many people called her Molly Pitcher because of the stories they had heard about the daring rescue trip she made in the South. Her friends in New York had urged her to go to Boston. People there were eager to meet her and equally eager to help her. In early December 1858, she arrived in Boston with a little packet of letters of introduction and a small bundle of daguerreotypes, pictures of some of her old friends like Garrett Smith and Thomas Garrett. That afternoon of her arrival, she sat in the front parlor of a boarding house waiting for a man named Franklin B. Sanborn. She had never met him, she had never seen him, but she knew some of her, he knew some of her friends. One of the letters of introduction she had brought from New York was addressed to him. She felt a little strange in Boston. She never thought of her own safety. It was just that this city was unlike New York or Philadelphia or Syracuse or any other city she had known. The streets were very narrow and as crooked as a hickory stick. Most of them were cobbled. From what little she had seen of this famous old city, it looked like a place where it would be easy to get lost. She folded her hands in her lap and her lips curved into a smile. Why would she get lost here? She had traveled thousands of miles and never lost her sense of direction. Suddenly she frowned. How would she recognize Mr. Sanborn? Suppose some slave catcher came instead. Boston was said to be overrun with them. Then there was a tap on the door of the parlor. She said, come in, and stood up holding herself very straight. The tall man who entered, smiled, said, Mrs. Tubman, and when she nodded, said, I'm Franklin Sanborn. She did not answer him. Instead, she opened the little package of pictures that she had placed on a table near her chair and handed one of them to him. Because it had occurred to her that if she re he recognized the picture, then surely he was who he said he was, Franklin B. Sanborn. In the back of her mind, an old memory flared. The Sims boy, Anthony Burns, Shadrick, all of them arrested here in Boston, charged with being fugitives, and she was a fugitive too. For all she knew, this big young man smiling at her with such cordiality might be a sheriff or... Do you know who that is? She asked. He raised his eyebrows. It's Garrett Smith, he said. Why do you ask? When she explained, he nodded, his eyes amused. You're quite right to be cautious. As she continued to stand... He said, let's sit down and talk. He sat down beside her, asked her a few questions, listened intently as she answered, kept her talking for more than an hour. As he was leaving, he asked her if she would make a speech at an anti-slavery meeting in about two weeks. At first, she refused, but he overrode her objection, saying, you have no idea how important it is that you should tell some of these stories to the people here in Boston. Two weeks later, there she was on the platform at Funeral Hall, she was wearing a dark gray long-skirted cotton dress. The only adornment was a bit of lace at the neck and jet buttons down the front. She held an old black reticule on her lap. The other speakers were distinguished-looking men, Wendell Phillips, Franklin Sanborn, Thomas Wentworth Higginson. When Sanborn introduced her, she stood looking shyly at this audience of well-dressed people, not knowing what to say, and someone on the platform asked her a question and then another. Then she started talking, telling about the trip she had made back into the slave country, how she carefully selected the slaves that would go north with her, how they traveled mostly on foot, wading through rivers, hiding in haystacks, in barns. Sometimes there were babies in the party, and once when there were twin infants, tiny babies that she had drugged with opium so they would sleep, she found that one of the stopping places on the route had a new and hostile owner. She had expected to find food and shelter for her passengers. Anne instead had to hurry them along, hungry, cold, fearful, and she herself fearful too. She had led them to the edge of a swamp, and she remembered there was an island in the swamp, so she took them there, leading them through the tall, rank swamp grass, urging them on, because the people at the farm where she had stopped might well spread the word that a group of runaways was in the neighborhood. She had them lie down in the swampy grass, so tall it concealed them completely. It was so cold there on that sedgy little island, and they shivered, their clothes sodden with mud. Only the babies, the little twins, were dry and warm in their basket. She said she looked at them, looked at their small brown fists, and thought of them as treasures, tiny treasures who would be free with the help of the Lord. 
She stayed there all day. They stayed there all day. All day she prayed, Lord, I'm going to hold steady on to you. There was always danger on the road, always the unexpected, but the Lord had never failed her. The sun began to go down and the tall grass looked golden. Then the light began to fade and water birds murmured their good night songs. It was dusk and the little island was all shadow. When she saw a man, he was walking up and down along the edge of the swamp. She frowned, watching him, wondering what he was doing there. He could not possibly see them. He wore the wide-brimmed hat of a Quaker, and she thought perhaps he is really a friend, and yet one could never be sure. Anyone could put on the clothes of a Quaker. A Quaker's clothing did not turn a man into a friend. His lips kept moving. She thought he must be talking to himself. She listened, and she heard what he said. My wagon stands in the barnyard of the next farm, right across the way. The horse is in the stable. The harness hangs on the nail. He repeated these words. Then he was gone as suddenly as he had come. When it was completely dark, Harriet left the little island, moving slowly, quietly. She looked back. The tall grass concealed where her passengers lay. No one passing by would, have, would know that they were there. They did not move. They did not talk. She approached the farm as cautiously, as quietly as she had left the island, a prayer on her lips. Sure enough, there was a wagon, a big farm wagon in the barnyard. She reached inside it, felt along it, to make certain that no one lay concealed in it. One never knew when one might be walking straight into a trap of some kind. Her hands touched something bulky, and she gave an exclamation of surprise. There was a package on the floor of the wagon, bulky. She pulled it toward her and almost cried from thankfulness, for she could smell food. After that, she moved quickly into the barn. A big white horse turned his head toward her, and she patted him, then put on the harness. A few minutes later, she had hitched him to the wagon and was driving toward the little island. Thus, she and her passengers rode to the next stop on the road, the Underground Railroad, a farm belonging to another Quaker where they left the horse and wagon to be picked up by its owner. She described the rest of the journey, the stop at Thomas Garrett's in Wilmington, and the slow journey north to Philadelphia, where William still recorded their names and the names of their owners in thick notebook. This first-hand information about the Underground Railroad by a woman who had served as one of its conductors thrilled that first audience before whom she spoke. They stood on their feet and cheered and clapped when she finished. After that first speech, she was a much sought after speaker in Boston and its environs. Her appearance had undergone subtle changes during the course of the years. There was something brooding and tender in her face, a gentleness in her eyes. The lips were slightly compressed, the only indication of never quite fulfilled hunger for affection. Her speaking voice, deep in pitch, slightly husky, was more beautiful than ever. Yet sometimes she sat on a platform in plain sight of an audience and went sound asleep, just as she had often done on the long road to the north. In spite of this strange handicap, she was tremendously successful public speaker. During that winter in Boston, she saw John Brown several times. He called himself Captain Smith because he did not want his enemies to know his whereabouts. Harriet told him all she knew of the routes to the north, the hiding places on the way out of Maryland, drawing crude maps for him. During the spring and early summer, she waited for a further word from him and heard nothing more. She was much in demand as a speaker. She visited Concord, Framingham, Worcester, speaking at anti-slavery meetings. Early in June, Thomas Wentworth Higginson told her that he had had a letter from Franklin Sanborn and that Sanborn had said John Brown is desirous of getting someone to go to Canada and collect recruits for him among the fugitives with H. Harriet Tubman or alone. Higginson told her that he had lost confidence in the plan. He said that he had grown rather vague and dubious in his mind because of the repeated postponements. Harriet did not know what to think. The 4th of July had come and gone. On that day, she made a speech at a meeting of the Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society at Framingham. Someone said that Brown was in Maryland, and someone else said, no, he was in New York. On the 1st of August, she was back in Boston to make another speech. She liked Boston. Whenever she had a moment's leisure, she went to Boston Common. Sanborn had told her something of its history, said that years ago a Quaker, a woman, had been hanged there and that a mob once tried to hang William Lloyd Garrison there. Sanborn said that these days all manner of people aired their grievances on Boston Common. He spoke of Amelia Bloomer and laughed, describing the costume she had worn when she made a speech there one afternoon. She had on full, stiff trousers that reached all the way to her ankles and were tied there. 
He said it was one of the funniest sights he had ever seen. Harriet thought that over, and thought, though she did not say so, decided that she could have used such a costume many times. Long, full skirts would hamper any woman who had walked and ridden along a road that almost ran underground. Harriet never heard from John Brown again, never saw him again. She was unaware of the fact that Brown and his assistants kept referring to her in the letters that they sent to the Boston Abol abolitionists who were helping to finance this project. Harriet Tubman is probably in New Bedford sick. She has stayed in New England a long time and been a kind of missionary. I have sent a note to Harriet requesting her to come to Boston. When Harriet comes, but Harriet never came. Perhaps she was ill. Perhaps Higginson had told her that he had lost confidence to plan. Perhaps word of Frederick Douglass's absolute refusal to enter what he believed to be a steel trap had influenced her. In any event, she was not at Harper's Ferry, nor did she send any recruits from Canada. On October 17, 1859, she was in New York, visiting friends. It had been years since she had experienced that curious fluttering sensation of her heart, a wild beating inside her chest that she interpreted as a warning of danger. But that morning at the breakfast table, she held her hands against her chest. She said, something's wrong. Something dreadful has happened or is about to happen. Her hostess looked about the dining room, white tablecloth on the table, pretty china sprinkled with rosebuds, the good smell of bacon in the room, and the fragrance of coffee, and shook her head. But Harriet, she protested, there is always something wrong somewhere. Harriet frowned and closed her eyes, thinking, wondering. Then she shivered, feeling suddenly cold. It's Captain Brown, she said. Something is happening to him. Something dreadful has happened to him. No argument could shake off her feeling of disaster. Later in the day, they heard that the United States government arsenal at Harper's Ferry had been seized. The next day's papers carried the news, 18 men in the fire engine house with Brown. Ten of them were killed, including two of Brown's sons. John Brown had been taken prisoner. A week later, old John Brown was put on trial. He was found guilty and sentenced to death. Harriet was deeply affected by Brown's death. She worshipped his memory. It seemed to her amazing that a white man, free, independent, should have held such, such strong convictions on the subject of slavery that he was willing to risk his life in order that slaves should be free. Someone read her fi the final statement that he had made. She had it read over and over again until she knew parts of it by heart. I say I am not yet too young to understand that God in any respecter of persons. I believe that to have interfered as I have done, as I have always freely admitted I have done, in behalf of his despised poor, I did no wrong, but right. Harriet always regretted that he had not made his plans more carefully. The slaves in the area had no knowledge of his intention, had been given so much, not so much as a hint that such a plan existed, or that in any way involved them, and they were as disturbed and frightened by the action at Harper's Ferry as the rest of the country. She resolved to do something in memory of Captain John Brown, something she did not know what, in behalf of God's despised poor. John Brown was hanged at Charleston, Virginia on the 2nd of December, 1859. A rope made of South Carolina long stapleton cotton was displayed outside the jail. The placard above it read, No northern hemp shall help to punish our, felon, our felony. He became a ghost and a legend that haunted both north and south. In 1859, the Richmond Whig said, The miserable old traitor and murderer belongs to the gallows and the gallows will have its own. In Boston, Wendell Phillips, abolitionist and reformer, commended those who looked upon that gibbet of John Brown, not as, this, not as the scaffold of a felon, but as the cross of a martyr. And that's the end of chapter 20.